Hi everybody, welcome to today's video. I'm so happy to have you guys here for another topic. If you are brand new to the channel, welcome. I practice holistic medicine here in New York and my intention with this channel is to share with you guys relevant topics and things that I see in clinical practice to provide education and conversation around things we have to talk about because a lot of this stuff gets not talked about in the conventional medical model and people are struggling with different things. So welcome. If you know me, then hello. As per usual, welcome back. This is going to be a topic that a lot of people have requested for me to talk a little bit more about. I'm pretty active in a lot of groups on Facebook. I'm pretty active on Instagram. And I posted something about this topic and there were a lot of questions regarding testing and supplementation, herbal remedies, different types of um, instructions of how to use things. So the topic today that we're gonna talk about is of course, Epstein-Barr virus. This does come as like a second video to the video that was previously or most recently posted where I was talking about C19 reactivating viral load. And a lot of you guys were interested about that because you said, I still feel like I'm having issues after having C19. And if you haven't seen that video, go back one video. It's the video that was previously made before this. I'll link it down below, but it is talking about how one virus that we get can reactivate old viruses and create them to turn on or go from a place of dormancy into an activated place. So this is kind of like a second topic to that. I am gonna be looking down for a little bit because I have my computer here and I did ask you guys for questions that you wanted to know specifically about. So we are gonna dive into EBV Epstein-Barr virus herpes simplex number four so that we could talk about the things related to this because if you are dealing with this, I am with you energetically, spiritually, and sending you healing energy because it is not simple to navigate, deal with, handle, treat for the patient and the provider. And the reason why is a lot of viruses fall into the classification of what's called stealth infections. And stealth infections are secret infections or infections that are really, really hard to treat because they actually know how to hijack the host immune system and basically render it possible for the virus to still live or the bacteria to still live. You'll find that this virus, EBV, Epstein-Barr, does have family members, if you will, or cousins or siblings that act very similar. For those of you guys that may have had Lyme disease, which is a bacteria, well, you may be like, yep, I was treated multiple times for Lyme before it actually was eradicated from the body. Why, right? Why is it not so simple? Well, it's the nature of these critters that creates a little bit of a modification or a host immune response that sometimes can't always flag these things because everything mutates. Viruses mutate, bacteria mutate, they create biofilms, they create basically houses or igloos that they live in and then they can burrow into the tissue and then they can reactivate and then they can hide and then they can reactivate. So they're very tricky to deal with and my intention is that you guys can learn some tools and tricks that will support when you feel you're reactivated because the nature of especially EBV in particular is it does create chronic fatigue syndrome. It creates really, really, really uh, a lot of problems with energy. People find that their energy is just debilitating. I, I know people that I've connected with that have shared stories with me that they're not able to work and they're really not functioning by any means. It could be difficult to deal with just daily tasks. So I'm, I'm rambling as I do, but let's just dive into some of the questions you guys had. You had asked me from Instagram. Okay. First one was, the first question is, has anyone had good results with cat's claw? My functional medicine doctor is recommending this. I'm currently on Valtrex and lysine as well. I started thymosine peptides about a week ago. Cat's claw is a vine. It's a woody vine and you'll see it used in a lot of different viruses, HPV, human papillomavirus, HSV, which is herpes simplex viruses, and also EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. It does have a lot of other mechanisms or a lot of other conditions, I should say, that are supported by using cat's claw, but you'll find cat's claw, devil's claw as antivirals. And so this person is asking, 
has anyone had good results with it? And my, my kind of thought process is how are you responding to what you're currently doing with the Valtrex, which is an antiviral and also a lysine, which is an amino acid. Um, lysine by default is a viral inhibitor. It stops viral replication at the cellular genetic level. It works for a lot of different viruses, but it's really a great supplement for people to utilize. Now, none of this stuff that I'm sharing with you guys in this video is for treatment purposes. It's just for education purposes. You may recognize some of these herbs or some of these amino acids as things that you were um, told to utilize in your treatment plan or your care. So none of this is like, you should go out and take this, you should do this thing. It's really just sharing with you guys. These are some of the top things that people do. Um, I do recommend Cat's Claw. I like Cat's Claw. I've used it. There are other factors, and I do want to comment on this before we dive into the other questions. You can't just use antivirals and call it a day. You can't just take tinctures and homeopathic remedies for viruses and call it a day. The reason why is we'd also want to know the nature of the body when it comes to the body's ability to heal from a stress perspective. What I mean by that is you cannot heal living in a place of stress. And so you may have the perfect protocol, the perfect treatment plan option in place to help support viral load. And if you're bathed in a chemical cocktail of cortisol or adrenal stress, the treatment can't hold or can't work because the body cannot heal in a place of sympathetic dominance. So I just wanna really reiterate, reiterate that point that when you're working with someone on viral load and how to support yourself, my best suggestion is that it's a full body systemic approach, looking at are we out of that fight or flight mode? Are we actually moving our bowels, right? Are our detox pathways open? We can't just go in and shake up a dirty fish tank and not have a filter on. We have to make sure that we're sweating and we're using our lymphatic system to, to detox. We have good, healthy integrity at the level of the liver, right? We have healthy levels of glutathione that is being produced in our liver. So by default, when it comes to how do we support anybody from any condition, especially viruses, what my, my intention for you guys to understand is it's not as linear as take the antivirals and boom, this will be gone. It's really a matter of are we looking at your hormones? Do you have a hormonal imbalance as well? And the truth of the matter is, guys, that most of the time, there's multiple things happening at once. It's never just as simple as I have a virus. It's, oh, I have a virus and I have pathogens that are inside of me and I also am dealing with adrenal issues and maybe I'm dealing with Hashimoto's or I have thyroid stress. You'll find that these conditions cluster together because when we have one thing broken, it kind of invites other things to break as well. So it's not as simple as a cookie cutter approach. The next question is, I was recently diagnosed with reactivated EBV in July. I went through silver IV treatments and I'm currently on monolaurin. I was, I was just tested positive for C19. That verbiage is a little, a little broken. That's okay. There's no judgment there. Um, but will this screw up EBV getting deactivated? Will I have to do things all over again? I love this question. So it sounds like what she's saying is, she had just undergone all these treatments that were supportive, probably using some type of like uh, colloidal silver or silver treatment. And she just recently got tested and is positive for C19. And she's wondering, how is this gonna affect my treatment? What's gonna happen with me having C19 and EBV? And my answer, unfortunately, is I am finding from a lot of people that having C19 is reactivating EBV. And like I said, please go back and watch the video that I made a video before this, I link it down below because it's talking about the mechanism of action of how that happens and why that happens. So I don't wanna say that the treatment wasn't, you know, for nothing. It helps, right, to keep viral load down. I am a big proponent of staying up to date on the research on PubMed and National Institute of Health, uh, clinical journals of, you know, oncology and, EBV is linked to a lot of lymphomas. It's, it's being linked to more and more autoimmune conditions and Burkitt's lymphoma, lymphoma, people that have swelling in their neck, they feel swollen lymph nodes often. Maybe they're spiking fevers of unknown origin. They have triple digit EBV in their blood and they're still having positive IgMs for months or for years on end. And clinically they're showing symptoms of swollen lymph nodes and lymphadenopathy and 
other things, well, they may have white blood cell count that's either high or low. They may have lymphocytes in their blood work that are either high or low. And all of those cells are part of the immune system. So their immune system chemistry is a little kooky and they're saying, yeah, I get sore throats often. Now, EBV loves the neck. It loves the thyroid. This is the throat chakra energetically, but this also is home to anatomically a lot of lymphatic tissue and our thyroid, which lives pretty much right here. So a lot of times with EBV, it likes to affect the thyroid. It likes to go into the lymphatic channels of the neck and create low level sore throats or lymph nodes that often people have to go get sonogrammed or ultrasound because they're concerned about a palpable or a painful or a kind of lymph node that feels knotted in their neck. Um, so uh, Sherry, to answer your question, I, I do believe it's gonna create a little bit of stress and it's very possible that it can reactivate your dormant EBV. That's very possible and you can still quiet it down. You already went through the course of care, so you can still have some success by kind of going back. My invitation to a lot of my patients when they're dealing with this is I always encourage them what to watch out for during reactivation. And honestly, most people know, they're like, I feel it, right? I'm in my body feeling what it feels like to be reactivated. I'm feeling the fatigue. I'm feeling the swollen glands. I'm feeling horrible. I'm feeling the brain fog. I'm feeling the inflammation. You start to understand, aha, I, I do believe that currently I'm in a reactivated place. This one is a really, really long one, but let's answer this one. So somebody, uh, Naomi, I should say, Naomi is asking, according to my latest labs, high absolute lymphocytes, high absolute monocytes, high C-reactive protein, and then she also linked her values. Anyone else diagnosed with reactivated or chronic EBV with similar lab work, question mark. I have neurological symptoms with suspected Epstein-Barr that's reactivated and potentially crossed the blood-brain barrier or is traveling along the nerve roots. I'm still waiting to go over my labs with my doctor. Um, I'm very concerned about this and wondering if anyone else had similar things. Yes, 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 yes to all of it. So high sensitivity C-reactive protein is an acute phase liver protein. It's produced, it's a cell or a marker that's produced a protein that's produced inside of the liver. The liver is a large lymph node. The liver is a massive lymph node. So yes, it's possible that your HSCRP is elevated because your lymph node is responding to your immune system being activated because of a virus. And the monocytes, now monocytes are part of why we call Epstein-Barr virus mononucleosis, right? Mononucleosis mononucleosis or monocytes are part of the white blood cell lineage. When we look at all of the soldiers, if you will, involved with who's coming out to play if I'm dealing with this type of infection, you'll find that there's a whole host of multiple cells involved with this response. Lymphocytes are also in that same lineage. These are basically cells of the white blood cell family. And they are, lymphocytes in particular, are more involved with viral infections. Monocytes are found under peripheral blood smears. When we look at EBV under a microscope, you'll find lymphocytic infiltration, AKA lymphocytes in the blood smear. And you'll also find monocytes as well. That's why we call it mononucleosis because of the histology or basically the chemistry under the microscope. So she's asking us, are these things that are in my blood work connected to what's going on with my, my presentation of EBV. Yes, it is likely connected. You don't start having issues with your immune system and the cells involved with the immune system for no reason. There's a driving force behind this and um, likely that's what's happening. Now, viruses love to travel along nerves. They like nerve roots, so people get neurologic symptoms. There is a correlation between EBV and, and um, multiple sclerosis which we know is a demyelinating um, neurologic condition, right? The myelin sheath that surrounds the nerves basically breaks apart. And now those nerves that are inside that sheet are exposed and kind of um, not really supported fully because they don't have the myelin, which is how we conduct the electrical impulse or how we send signals through the nerves. The point of the story, guys, is that viruses do travel along nerve roots. And that's why you'll find a lot of neurologic symptoms associated with EBV as well. There are a lot more questions. Uh, someone's asking if you had to pick Valtrex or Lysine. They're very similar. I personally like Lysine 
better. I actually read this question and I um, was thinking about this in depth. L-lysine is an amino acid that basically stops the virus from being able to read the alphabet. So for example, the virus, when it replicates, is gonna say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. L-lysine, when you take it, it basically allows the virus to say A, B, C, D, space. It can't re, it can't re, um, what's the right word? It can't keep going with its basically reading of the DNA when it has L-lysine in it. That's opposite that's opposite than arginine, which arginine things, arginine rich foods, high arginine diets actually cause more, more replication of the viruses. So I like L-lysine. I like it. It's in things. If you're eating animal sources of protein, if you're eating certain things, you're getting lysine and you do need a little bit more. I like 1000 milligrams of lysine three times a day, three grams of lysine every single day for a lot of different viruses. But I, I would choose L-lysine as basically my kind of choice between Valtrex or L-lysine when it comes to EBV and other viruses as well. I know that that's a lot and I hope that that helped clarify some of your questions. If you guys have more questions, please link them down below. I really like this style and this format of answering questions. I find it to be a little bit more supportive for you guys and more direct to help guide you um, in terms of like what are...